Well, everybody in the, in the country was stunned. With the exception of uh, people in the military, uh, I was uh, in the Marine Corps seven months prior to Pearl Harbor, and we knew eventually we would get into the war situ situation because uh, Germany had already invaded Poland with Europe and they're fighting the British. And uh, so that was it. All Marines were infantry at that time until you went to your first assignment. Uh, some Marines went uh, directly to the air group or they went to uh, supply school. But most of us were infantry. In those days, we took our uh, 1903 rifles and a backpack. We went on a train, went directly to the Washington Navy Yard, and I was assigned there for guard duty. President Roosevelt had a yacht at the Washington Navy Yard, and usually on weekends he would go aboard that yacht. And the Marines, we always uh, stood at the gangway there and presented arms, and there was always a, a six man Marine detachment aboard that yacht. And they usually uh, cruise down to the uh, uh, the river to all the way down to Norfolk sometimes and came back out for the uh, for the weekend. So we, I saw President Rose many many times in the, on those occasions. Well, at the Macon Island, which was August 1942, uh, Major Roosevelt was was ordered back to Washington, D.C., and the Commandant of the Marine Corps established two more radio battalions, the 3rd and 4th Radio Battalion. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Roosevelt then uh, went up down the East Coast interviewing people for the 4th Radio Battalion. That was his battalion. I was personally interviewed by uh, Colonel Roosevelt in the Washington Navy Yard. There was about 40 of us that were interviewed and uh, I was one of the ones that was uh, selected for the 4th Regiment Battalion. Well, you had to be a uh, excellent swimmer to begin with. You wanted you to be an excellent swimmer, and you wanted you to be at least a sharpshooter, rifle, and pistol. And then he asked you a question, why do you want to be a raider? Well, I had a brother, Bruno Ansack, who lived his entire life in Poland. And uh, he fought in the Polish Army during the, when he fought the Germans in 1939. The prisoner of war, but he was a farmer, and he, he went back to the farm and worked for the uh, Nazi regime, you know. So he survived, and we did not know what happened to him for about eight years till after the war. And that was one of the reasons I, I wanted, wanted to get in, into the war and help win the war against the Nazis. So. A, that was a good point on my part because he says, this young Polish boy has a grudge against the uh, Axis powers, and uh, so we, uh, I made the fourth trade battalion. After it was, uh, we were selected uh, for the fourth battalion, we were we went to Camp Pedal and we trained at Camp Pedal. We were there. October, November, December, and February, we went overseas on the President Polk, and we did all our training in uh, Camp, Camp Pendleton, Tent Camp Tree, adjacent to San Clemente. We did a lot of rubber boat training, and a lot of forced march, marches, and uh, a lot of night uh, fighting. We, had, uh, we did martial arts, knife fighting, and uh, a lot of rubber boat training because on Macon Island, the raiders there had a problem with the rubber boats getting back to the submarine. So we did a, a lot of rubber boat training. Well, uh, we were eager to get into combat after all that hard training at Camp Pendleton and in, in, uh, Guadalcanal and doing a little mop-up uh, uh, patrols there. We were very, very eager to go. So when we were ordered to, uh, to Segi Point to help uh, Captain Kennedy, uh, they knew the Japanese were ready to attack. We were eager to get in there and uh, meet and destroy the enemy. In fact, many of us were afraid the war was going to end before we got there. That's how motivated we were. We were very motivated. 
squads in those days, uh, Raider, Raider days, was a 10-man squad, uh, three fire teams. So you had the squad leader, then you had the, uh, the first fire team was the Thompson submachine gun, which I had, two M1s. Second fire team was three M1s, and the third fire team was two M1s and a BAR. That was the composition of a Marine Raider squad. Right, uh, squad. Well, we first went to New Hebrides, and I happened to be in the advanced detail to go to the canal. And uh, while we were in the New Hebrides, and uh, before we went to the New Hebrides, we operated a, 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 the old World War I destroyers called APDs, assault personnel destroyers. The uh, World War I destroyers had four stacks. They removed the two rear stacks and made room for about 150 personnel. And they used those APDs for moving uh, people like the Raiders, reconnaissance teams, and also supplies for supplies, supply outposts and areas in the outlying areas, uh, islands in the Pacific. But we did a lot of training off APDs off the rubber boat, daytime, nighttime, constantly. And we went through many islands looking for a Japanese outposts, listening posts, coast watcher posts. And uh, there's a lot of islands around the New Hebrides and islands around the Guadalcanal. We were on New Georgia seven days. The 4th Raider Battalion, OMP Company, was on New Georgia seven days before the 1st Battalion Raider Battalion or the Army Unit uh, uh, invaded uh, uh, New Georgia. And that was because a Captain Kennedy a British coast washer in Sagi Point in New Georgia had a, uh, uh, a native, uh, natives, uh, 60 natives with, uh, armed with the infield rifles, uh, 1903 rifles, and a couple of Lewis machine guns. They were told that the Japanese knew they were there and they were ready to attack uh, Sagi Point. That's when Owen P. Company and uh, Colonel Carmen went to Sagi, uh, overnight deal. We were there for about two days, set up uh, defense perimeters, and then the Army came in, set up the defense. From there, we went on our way through the jungle to attack Rue Harbor. The terrain in New Georgia is a very uh, heavy foliage, uh, mangrove swamps, from the Sunny down all the way down to the beach. There were very, very few open beaches. New Georgia, was a, to me, was a big swamp, very similar to Bougainville. I was not on Bougainville, but they, New Georgia was mangrove swamps all the way down to the shoreline. The heaviest weapon we have, of course, is the light machine guns and the 60 mortar ones. But on New Georgia, the overhead, overhead foliage was so hard uh, you couldn't use them. When the Japanese in defense positions, of course, cleared the overhead, they used their mortar type uh, and uh, heavy weapons also. In that. So we were at a disadvantage in uh, places like New Georgia when we were in attack mode. We had to rely strictly on uh, light weapons and machine guns that, and hand grenades. That, that was about it. After the New Georgia campaign in February 1944, the Raiders were uh, disestablished, and we had the honor of being uh, uh, the 4th Marine Regiment. That was a great honor for us. The four Raider battalions were uh, disestablished. I was assigned to the Weapons Company uh, and 4th Marine Regiment on the Commander Captain Luckle, Ray Luckle, who I met years later as a Lieutenant Colonel, and uh, had malaria and dengue fever. I ended up in, in, in the hospital. And that's what, uh, when the, uh, the regiment was being formed with uh, combat companies and weapons companies, whatever they decided to put me in the military police. Each regiment had a military police company in those days. And I was assigned to the military, military police company, which was okay. I was 
a little beat up at that time. And I, I was a little uh, mad because I was used to a uh, good, you know, Raider training with the Raiders and the combat organization. Although the military police uh, had a job to do, and we did it. Battle of Guam, uh, we landed at Aga Beach, uh, which was he heavily fortified, concrete bunkers, what have you. The Japanese had like 37 millimeter cannons on each side of the uh, uh, Aga Beach. And I, I was in about the third wave, and I remember there's about four or five LVTs, land and vehicle tractors, burning and uh, up on the beach that were knocked out. And but we were moving in uh, on Agate. It was heavily fortified at Agate. And uh, our job was to keep the uh, process of keeping the lanes open and moving and picking up stragglers as the uh, battalions were going forward in a combat situation. So we had a job to do. You know, we, we set up a, what they call them our detention centers, I guess. So uh, but primarily our job was to keep the traffic moving in a straggler type situation. So, and Okinawa was a little more because there was more the Japanese there, a lot of Korean labor, laborers that were attached to the Japanese units in those days, you know. The Guam operation, Okinawa, you know, there was a lot of uh, Korean laborers that they utilized, not Japanese. We went uh, up to Mount Alifan, and from there we went uh, to Rote Peninsula, where the old Marine barracks were that. That's where I uh, got the severe damage to my right eardrum. We were following uh, a Sherman tank and it was a mop up operation. And the Japanese took uh, these uh, torpedoes, the naval torpedoes, put them in the, in the ground, uh, buried them in the ground. And anything 250 pounds or heavier, or 300 pounds or heavier, you know, it, they blew up. In this case, the Sherman tank was about 100 yards in front of us. And uh, we were the, the, the picking up stragglers in those days. But uh, this tank hit this uh, torpedo and of course uh, it was blown out of action and the people in the tank were uh, 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 killed. But uh, I the other busted eardrum as an example of that that situation on the Rote Peninsula, and uh, of course uh, there was more open t t t t uh, terrain fighting on Guam because it was, it was not like New Georgia or Bougainville with heavy vegetation, so you could maneuver much better with tanks. In fact, the first time we saw Japanese tanks was on in my my experience was on Guam going up to Mount Elephant. There was uh, about three or four light Japanese tanks that were knocked out by our tanks. Uh, so that was the first time we saw uh, Japanese tanks. The, the invasion of Guam was the Pacific Normandy, uh, uh, biggest amphibious operation in the Pacific area. And we trained on uh, Guadalcanal and then we went aboard ship and we went to Ulysses. And we were aboard ship for about six weeks. We thought we might be going to Iwo Jima at that time. But uh, there's no place to land on Iwo Jima because there's three divisions there already and uh, it was heavily con contested. So uh, actually uh, we ended up on Okinawa and uh, like I say, the training there was a, was a larger magnitude more tank training, tank support, heavy artillery support, that kind of stuff. So, so the training there was much different from the early days, my Marine Raider days. We upgraded our training uh, constantly, you know, as each campaign was involved, then we, the, the units became larger and the operations were more maneuverable in use of of uh, 
you know, artillery and, and you know combat arms type situation, air, air strikes and that kind of stuff. Sixth Division went to about spent about 16 days in the motor movement and cleaned that out. Then we went south with the first division and the three army divisions. But the first day of landing on Okinawa, of course, was was rather mild. They let us come ashore. And, uh, and that very first night, on, at where we, Kadena Air Base is now where we landed, the kamikazes came in in, in the very first day. We had a lot of kamikaze action throughout the Okinawa campaign. Primarily during the last phase of it, uh, there was a lot, the last stand, of course, and, they, and the Navy took a real beating on Okinawa from kamikaze. I watched the kamikazes and the first day hit one of our destroyers and they just folded in half and went down in the first night. So again, uh, life at the military police company was a little lighter as, as opposed to being in the front line units. But we, we had our share of bad times also because we supported the battalions right up front all, all, all the way through the campaign. And, uh, Again, when we, after the Marine 6th Division went up north after 16 days, it took over the Motor Wolf Peninsula, which included the town of Nago, one of my favorite places. Uh, we went south with the 1st Division and the 3i Divisions, where the main battle took place. So the 6th Marine Division actually was, uh, was responsible for about 55% of, of taking o Okinawa, really. So, we had a uh, time. Because we were on the right flank in the three army division on the left flank. And we, they were pretty well stalled because uh, the southern part of the Okinawa would had open areas and you had ridge lines. You had about a mile of open terrain ridge line, a mile of open terrain and ridge line, which finally led to the main fortification, Shuri Castle, Sugarloaf Hill, and those areas where the casualties were very, very, very high, very high. Fighting at Circle of Hill, we supported the 22nd Marines primarily. They took Circle of Hill about six times and were overtaken by the Japanese six times. 22nd Marines got heavy casualties. Finally, we withdrew them and the 4th Marines went in and finally took Circle of Hill. And again, we were in a sport mode with the military police company, but we were very, very close to each of those uh, battalions, you know. The uh, Army, Army Regiment, the 4th Marines, 22nd Marines. But the 22nd Marines had a lot of casualties on the Sugar Bowl field, a lot of casualties. And the Army uh, was on the left flank. They finally overpowered Shuri Castle, the main uh, uh, defensive positions for the Japanese, uh, which was Shuri Castle. And uh, the 4th Marines, 22nd and 29th Marines, we were heavily involved in that. Of course, the 15th Marines uh, artillery units were with us. So I remember Sugarloaf Hill very vividly. We lost a lot of tanks there. We were there for about three weeks. And the heavy rains at that time, mud and muck, and uh, really a bad situation. Every time the forward elements took the hill, the Japanese retook it, up, back and forth, back and forth. So it was a sort of a bad situation there for a while, but eventually the Marines prevailed, you know. After Okinawa, we went back to Guam and refitted. And when I was back on Guam, uh, the first, second day we got back on Guam, I re-enlisted my enlistment was up for four years. And about three weeks later, they dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. So I had enough points for three guys to go back home. This is Sergeant Anzac, uh, I, said, I have enough points. He said, you just re-enlisted, you were going to Japan. So a lot of the guys that I knew went back home. I ended up, which was okay. Uh, uh, 
Uh, I said, well, we go to Japan, I'm not going to make it this one. It's going to be all over. So thank God they dropped the atomic bomb and uh, otherwise. I was very, very fortunate. And my story to most young men is, is that even though uh, go to get about school as you can, in my case, I had World War II career in Vietnam to help me. And hard work and dedication to duty, you know, I survived. But it was very, very, very difficult. It was a stupid way to do it. I'm very, very proud of my service in the Marine Corps. And uh, the history and traditions of the Marine Corps, uh, we get a lot of that from the British Marines to begin with. When Marines graduate from boot camp, they finally get that, get that Marine Corps, and they're no longer a recruit, they're a Marine. These the tears come out of most, most of the way, you can see that. And the difference there is tradition and uh, hard work, and dedication to duty, and dedication to your country and to your corps. That, that, that's the main thing. Uh, being a former drill instructor, and being in a high school dropout, I, I can tell you that uh, it's very, very difficult not to love the Marine Corps and the people in it, in the day, our dedication to our Corps and our values. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful field. So, any young man who wants to go to the Marines, stay tough, work hard, be dedicated, do your job the best of your ability, you'll be fine. It's going to be tough.